All right, can you see it? I think you can. Okay. <laughs> so thank you guys for joining me. As he said, I am a security analyst in my day job. Um, however, I have also struggled with um, ADHD throughout my entire journey. Most of it was undiagnosed. So uh, this presentation is supposed to be informational. Um, I'm most interested in the questions anyone has uh, because that would be the most helpful. But um, I'm hopeful that my presentation definitely gives you some clue into how the process has been going and what I've done with the process. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been in the tech industry for seven years total. I was doing support roles at first, um, and, and then I transitioned to the security industry a couple of years ago um, by becoming a, a team of one, a security team of one. That was my first security role ever. Um, I've been in the industry throughout, but I was doing support first, and then I transitioned into security two years ago. Um, and as he said before, I am a level two security analyst for Cisco, actually, um, but I support Duo. Um, I blog in my spare time, which I don't have much of these days, at stephansec.com. I also co-host a podcast um, uh, called Coolest Nerds in the Room, and I'm a speaker, as you can see, and also a psychology enthusiast. So I guess I'm one of the best positioned people to have ADHD because that kind of stuff interests me anyway. So the inspiration for this talk, um, I was diagnosed with ADHD last year, uh, the first time in like, I think January or February, somewhere in the winter time, um, after almost six years in the industry. Um, if you know what being in the industry is about, it's filled with learning, both structured and unstructured. You kind of have to be good with always being in a mode of learning. Um, so something like ADHD can definitely interfere with that, uh, as I'll discuss in this uh, talk. But also the pressure to always make sure that you're staying knowledgeable about certain things definitely sticks to you. Um, and it was definitely something that affected me throughout my six years before being diagnosed, um, which is why I hope that this talk is helpful. Uh, along with that, uh, I had struggles with traditional schools, and by traditional schools, I mean brick and mortar. You know, you have a semester, it's four months. Um, you have one, like three or four classes that you're doing at the same time, but basically there's one structure for taking them. Um, those kinds of schools I struggled with heavily, increasingly over the years. And um, also I talked on Twitter about my journey just lightly and a lot of people responded to it. There's actually a lot of people uh, in tech that have ADHD or some sort of neurodivergent um, type of condition, I guess, if you wanna call it that. And I just feel like paying it forward is very important. In my career, people have paid it forward and it has benefited me. So I'm hoping that this will benefit somebody else out there. So, here are some disclaimers that I wanted to give to make sure I touched on um, right at the beginning of the talk because I just feel like it needs to be said. Um, I can't unfortunately tell you if you have ADHD or not. Uh, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, um, so I, I honestly don't know. Uh, however, if you do consult with them, there are several different methods that they have for diagnosing ADHD, so a visit would definitely clear that up. But I just want to say, I, if those were one of the questions that you have, I can't diagnose you. Um, also, this is my story. Uh, it may differ from other stories that you've heard or from your story. Um, and also what I share today may work for you or it may not work. Um, life is a journey and you kind of have to do the trial and error thing. Um, unfortunately, a lot of us want to get away from that, including me, <laughs> but you kind of have to try. Uh, and my journey is ongoing. I'm still learning, but I don't have all the answers currently. Um, I have some answers, but it's only been about a year and a half in this journey. So I'm definitely not going to have <laughs> some answers that other people might, um, but I'll do my best to answer them or point you in the right direction if I, if I know what their direction is. So those are just some things I wanted to touch on at first. So what is ADHD? 
Uh, ADHD is a neurological disorder that impacts the parts of the brain that help us plan, focus on, and execute tasks. So you're thinking about your inner parent when you think about ADHD and your inner parent basically going on vacation and never coming back. Um, other people can kind of function as your inner parent. That's why a lot of us don't figure out we have ADHD or anything like that until college, um, because it's the first time that you're truly on your own and and truly seeing if you've learned anything about survival or managing yourself while under your parents' care. Um, so a lot of us are, you know, using our parents as our uh, executors <laughs> of that part of our brain um, and don't know that until we leave the nest and then it all goes to chaos. <laughs> so, um, and the graphic works now. <laughs> so I know the graphic did not work a few seconds ago. So what is ADHD continued? Um, it varies in presentation. You're gonna hear a lot about subtypes and things like that. And also the research with, with ADHD as well as anything else is ongoing. Um, so currently, you may be hyperactive or inattentive or a mixture of both. Um, hyperactive is probably the one that's most familiar to a lot of people when it comes to talking about ADHD. So with that, you have inability to sit still, you can't stay in line, you interrupt people, you may have to hum or have something playing or loud or make a noise when you're doing things. Um, that's kind of the hyperactive side of it. And then you have the inattentive side, which is more internal and more has to do with your brain. You, you can't concentrate. You might forget things. Um, you may zone out when people are talking to you, those kinds of things. Um, and the reason that that's a very important specification is because ADHD itself uh, is hard to diagnose um, in a blanket way. Some people don't even find out until their 40s. Some people don't find out much later. Um, so you can go a long period of time without it. And like I said before, some people close to us can function as our executive function. So we may not even know that we have a problem until either a person leaves our life or our circumstances change, something like that. Um, also, it's definitely more difficult to diagnose in, in girls too when young because they tend to um, kind of be trained differently than, than boys. So a lot of times they might be over told, hey, sit still, you know, things like that because you're a girl. And that behavior can kind of trick or fool people into thinking that there isn't an, an issue because a girl might be more quiet, um, however, may not be listening to what you're saying still. Um, and it impacts 11% of children and 5% of adults. The thing about this is that this is these are reported cases, um, not accounting for the large amount of people that go underreported. Um, ADHD is underreported uh, for various different reasons. Um, I chose this graphic because it was funny to me, mostly because in society, I think things that we don't understand, we tend to want to snuff it out instead of trying to figure out a way to utilize it, uh, its strengths. I think with anything, there's strengths in certain things like ADHD, a lot of people will tell you a strength is hyper-focus, um, meaning you can spend hours not eating, not sleeping, not doing anything, but focusing on what you're supposed to. And that that seems like a superpower. The only thing is you can't choose what it is that you hyper-focus on. So, um, I, I felt like that graphic is definitely uh, pointed in terms of thinking about our society and things like this and how the reaction is there <laughs> to that. What ADHD is not? So common misconceptions, ADHD is not a mental illness or a behavior disorder, um, and it's not even a learning disability. Now, it does affect your learning by the nature of ADHD, but it is not a learning disability. Um, and it's also not a person being lazy or not trying hard enough. I chose this graphic because sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes that first step is very, very high, <laughs> as you can see, and you have no idea how how you're going to get there or why it's that high. Um, all you know is that you are at the bottom there and you're looking up at the top trying to see how you're going to get to that next uh, that next level. So. I felt like it was, it, I felt seen the first time I saw this uh, because that probably is most of my life, figuring out how to get to that 
that first wrong. However, a lot of us with ADHD um, or any kind of undiagnosed neurological um, disorder, uh, a lot of us figure it out sometimes. We can be very resourceful because we have to be. And so we figure out a way to build rungs into the base of that and, and, and get our way to the top. But sometimes and oftentimes it doesn't, especially when um, you're suffering through it, like you're not managing it very well. Um, ADHD is, develop, is a developmental impairment of the brain's self-management system, but it doesn't have anything to do with the aforementioned. So symptoms of ADHD. Certain, and I also chose this graphic because that is a lot of my life, <laughs> but symptoms can be inattention, lack of focus, poor time management, weak impulse control, exaggerated emotions, hyperfocus, hyperactivity, which I talked about before, both of those, and executive dysfunction. So I want to double tap on a couple of these um, that I personally struggled with. So lack of focus and attention, that's definitely something that's been a struggle of mine, especially when it's something that I'm not particularly interested in. Uh, it can be difficult to pay attention because I could grab literally anything and follow a thought trail down that path. Um, I think a lot of us are, are, are like this, and, and I want to make the distinction here because I actually didn't put this in any other part of the presentation. So a lot of us might have a little bit of ADHD with a lot of these psychological things. We all have tr like little amounts of it. Um, when it becomes a disorder is when it significantly impairs your life. And there are other distinctions that uh, the DSM-5 has for diagnosing or classifying what qualifies as ADHD and what does not. And then, like I said, ongoing research. Um, but I just wanted to make that distinction uh, that uh, all of us could struggle with some of these at some point in time, but if it's not affecting your life, then I wouldn't even worry about it. However, it definitely has affected mine, inattention, lack of focus, and poor time management. Those are the most obvious and probably the most prevalent issues that I have. Um, I do hyper-focus as well, but uh, it never really seemed like a superpower to me. I thought that was uh, normal to be excited about something and just like spend hours on it. Um, and weak impulse control happens in and out, but not really as much for me as everything else. Um, at least not, not that I've not that I've recognized. Um, but executive dysfunction is definitely a big point for all of us with ADHD issues because that is the person inside of you, if I'm I'm if I'm trying to create an image, it is the person inside of you that is basically saying, hey, do this. And I know it's not fun. It doesn't seem like wash the dishes. The dishes have been sitting there for a couple of days. You need to wash the dishes. I know it's not fun. I know it's not what, what you want to do. However, we've got to wash the dishes. That part is essentially missing or not functioning all the time in the intended capac capacity. So a lot of times we might be productive only when there we're avoiding something that we need to be doing that's more urgent. Sometimes we can just completely forget things like checking the mail or going to the doctor or even a meeting that we scheduled. So a lot of times things like that can happen and that is a result of executive dysfunction. So uh, just to go over what we've just talked about and and things that were not that were <laughs> that are not covered in this presentation. Um, ADHD is something neurological, however, it isn't like a mental illness or a behavior disorder. It is basically um, an inability to manage yourself. Um, the things that are not covered here, but I feel like need to be kind of lightly touched on, I'm first generation American uh, with a Nigerian background. Um, uh, so there's really no support coming from the Nigerian community, uh, namely my parents, because that kind of thing is just not really talked about. Um, there's also the religious aspect. I do have a religious background as well. Um, and so growing up, saying things like I'm having issues with concentrating or anything like that, it was easily kind of dismissed as like, no, we don't claim bad things happen to us. Uh, you know, we trust in God. To, and this is not even um, 
talking specifically about religion being a problem in terms of or a barrier to having or treating ADHD, but more so saying that my whole perspective was shifted because I had a religious background. Um, so it's not acceptable to claim things like I'm depressed or I have attention deficit disorder. Like those things are just not said. Um, also, I am very resourceful. I think that's something that is should be noted because when I started working with my current ADHD uh, therapist, that is what she said. And everybody's case is going to be different. Um, I ended up being resourceful. I don't know where it came from. Or, I mean, there's a, there's a whole experience I'm probably uh, missing on what contributes to resourcefulness or what does not, or who would be resourceful and who does not. However, whenever you have something going wrong, sometimes you can overcompensate without even thinking about it. You just overcompensate. And I think the overcompensation definitely uh, contributed to my high functioning in terms of ADHD. So um, where this falls in for me, so where does ADHD come in for Stephanie? Um, I basically had a quarter life crisis, which is very dramatic to say, but I have no other words for what that was. Um, I wanted to be successful. I wanted to achieve things and not just for the sake of being successful, but just because I am that committed to my work and what I do. So I, I did want that and it was evading me. Um, I also was unsure of my abilities because by this point in time, the only indicator you have in your early 20s is school as an indication of success. It's not like you are expected to have climbed any kind of corporate ladder at that age. Um, so the fact that I wasn't really successful in school definitely made me doubt my abilities and overall intelligence because I just couldn't get it together, um, which I'll explain what that looked like in a, in a few moments. Um, I was also unable to accomplish long-term goals uh, that required daily effort. So um, my uh, therapist at the time, not at this time, but shortly after this period of time, uh, my therapist called it called me a sprinter instead of a marathoner, um, and said that you know if, if the goal is short enough and and the reward is big enough, I will probably be able to accomplish it. But if it's long and far in the future, my attention span just wouldn't allow me to continue with the goal. I'd I'd abandon it and work on something else. Um, also, lots of pressure. I had a lot of pressure on myself. Nigerians are notorious uh, notorious about academic success and making it very valuable. So I had a lot of pressure from family and uh, the community to excel and I was not. Um, also, I internalized some of that, you know, growing up, I internalized anything that I wasn't able to do. I internalized that as some sort of reflection on myself. So all of these things kind of happened at the same time, which translated in my mind to, I need to figure out what is going on. Um, in a very dramatic fashion. <laughs> so just to point out too, how did ADHD show up at work? And I wanted to put this graphic there because I feel like a lot of people feel that if you, if you are somebody with ADHD, people receive you as being late for the sake of you just don't respect other people's time or you just don't care or you're being disrespectful when it's often not any of those things. Um, I just had issues with time management. It would, and I watched myself over time because sometimes you do things on autopilot, you don't really know how you get to a certain place. I would watch myself sometimes and be two hours early and watch myself just delay and get lost in the process of getting ready and then be late. Or even if I was showing up to the parking garage 30 minutes early, I wouldn't be watching the time and then I'd be 15 minutes late. And so things like that would happen all the time where it seemed like I blinked and then time sped up and I was late. So that that's how it felt. Um, also, I couldn't focus on conversations without playing solitaire. I needed to do something with my hands, which is probably the hyperactivity, in order to anchor myself to the conversation. Otherwise, I would pick any word of anything that you said, and I would go off into my own. Like if you say issues, then I would think about 
issues, uh, tissue. And then I'm thinking about, oh, well, I need to pick up tissue after work. And then I lost where we are in the conversation. I think a lot of people that I've talked to that have ADHD have the same experience. So I couldn't show, I couldn't focus on conversations without playing solitaire. However, it looks really bad to be on your phone while you're in a meeting or while you're on a Zoom conference or anything like that. So I struggled with that a lot as well and communicating that because again, at this time, I did not know I had ADHD. Also, I needed to be learning something new regularly or I would get bored and disconnect completely from my work. And I needed a fast paced environment. I couldn't have too much uh, too much lag time or, or idle time at work. I needed to make sure that I was always doing something. How it showed up in school was slightly different. Um, how it felt was that what, what the graphic on the left says, uh, I definitely uh, ran away from homework sometimes. In the beginning, I was very much, yes, this is gonna be different semester. I'm gonna do everything. I'm attending classes, I'm doing homework. About a month and a half in, I super wouldn't care anymore. And I'd be like, oh my God, this is so endless. Like we're going every single day. Like, ugh, I don't need to do this. And then I'd stop caring, stop going uh, to class. And then I'd procrastinate on everything. Something else would take my attention. And then at the end of the semester, I'd rush to get all the assignments done, uh, which got me in hot water with uh, some, some, some professors because obviously they, that was a crazy amount of work at the end of the semester when they're supposed to be dreaming about Christmas or summer. Um, and then I would have a lot of end, end of semester cramming and anxiety. So I would just be cramming all night and all day and a lot of anxiety about passing because I didn't pay attention the entire time. So that's how it looked as, as well as school. And what did I do about it? Well, I knew I needed help. Um, I didn't know why I needed help, but I knew I needed it. Uh, so I started therapy and really was to fix myself, get my stuff together. That's kind of what I was thinking at the time. Um, and out of the gate, she immediately prescribed me with generalized anxiety, which I hadn't even considered. I never saw myself as an anxious person. Um, however, that's what she gave me at the time. And then I spent time on things that were easier and had consistent rewards. So things I wanted to go for a smaller win. So anything that was very short term that I could do and accomplish, I definitely would do that so I could get my self-esteem up at that time. Um, but also it just felt better to not disappoint myself or anyone else by kind of shooting lower than I was capable of. So at this point, um, I'm thinking something's wrong with me. I'm thinking I'm frustrated with myself. Why can't I get it together? What is going on? And I'm also thinking my idea of ADHD at this time is ADHD is for kids. You know, it's not something that adults struggle with. I only hear about kids doing it. And I always associated it with bad kids because in elementary school, it was always a kid that would like get up out of the seat or not stop talking or whatever that would get it like a, it wasn't an F at the time. I, I think it's a U is what you would get in elementary school for being unsatisfactory. And so I always thought that ADHD kids were just bad kids that just didn't want to behave because, and this is from a kid's perspective, I carried that into adulthood because that is the response is that the teacher is very hard on the kid that can't sit still, very much, you know, reprimanding the kid, very much saying the kid is, you know, you're not behaving, that kind of thing. And so I always thought of it as like, oh, I don't, you know, do that. I, I just can't focus. It's not like I, you know, but it's not explained that way. And if you don't have ADHD or have anyone around you with it, that's the understanding you might carry well into until you die. So the turning point for me uh, was a massive case of burnout, which is something that is prevalent in our industry. Um, I was diagnosed with depression during the burnout. I was placed on medical leave. Um, and then at the same time, a couple months into the leave, I got my first security job, which was a security team of one, very high stress job. Um, however, the issue started to compound and kind of be highlighted because as a security team of one, you need to have you need to have great control over your, your what's expected of you, over your responsibilities, making sure you keep, keep everything at the forefront of your mind. 
And so if you have existing issues with that, taking big goals and breaking them up and, and kind of going after them one by one over time, it's going to really show up for you um, in moments like this where I have a job where I, it was definitely paramount that I was very structured. I needed to be very structured. I needed to be on top of everything. I was building everything from the ground up. And so that's when I really noticed that there was a huge issue. And it didn't come up before because I had reactive work. And reactive work, you're just reacting. Somebody else is dictating how your the day goes based off of what they send to you. Um, when you're in security, not all of it is react. You hope not all of it is reactive unless you're doing incident response or something like that. So as soon as I switched to a project-based role, I started to notice I'm in trouble here. Um, I'm not able to concentrate and it seems like it's getting worse is what I thought. Um, and so they tried me on some antidepressants because again, they're going with the whole depression theory, um, but nothing, it didn't really help, you know, I, it didn't help at all. So that's where the graphic on the side comes. The harder I try, the worse I get. I'm spending all this money going to therapy, all this money um, trying to get evaluated, and nobody knows what is going on, least of all me. So finally, I am diagnosed with ADHD, and I, I, I tried three different times, and I tweeted about it because um, I felt like, again, there was a huge response from people on Twitter about having ADHD or some other neuro neurodivergent uh, disorder. Um, and so a lot of response, and then just a lot of support. And I think when you're going through something like this, and you can't really trust yourself all the way, or you feel like you can't, Having support is very paramount. Um, and so InfoSec Twitter has definitely been helpful in being supportive of, of those of us that struggle with ADHD. Um, but I shared it at that time because I first got diagnosed and, and maybe you felt the same or maybe you've heard of somebody who's felt the same. You first get diagnosed and uh, they just kind of say, oh, do you struggle with, like, what are your symptoms? And you're like, oh, I just have trouble concentrating. The first doctor was like, okay, cool, and just wrote me a prescription, like, immediately. And I was like, I don't feel comfortable with this. <laughs> I think that there's supposed to be more here. Um, however, I really needed to concentrate. Again, security team of one. I had actually transitioned to another security team of one gig. Um uh, which was, uh, again, stressful. Um, and so I really needed the assistance. So I ended up taking the medication that they gave and it did help. However, I just felt like it was like, I was like, is this how people, is how doctors do things? Like they just listen to you say, I could say whatever, and then they would give me whatever drug and then I would just be taking whatever. So I felt kind of uneasy about that when it came to around the summertime. I tried a different uh, doctor. This one had a sheet of paper that had like different things and you just had to check off certain things. So it would say, do you have problems paying attention? Check, you know, like give it a rating or a scale. Is it one to 10 or something? And then at the end of all the questions, you tally everything up. And depending on what your score is, you would be classified as ADHD. I also had an issue with this, and maybe some of you are like shaking your head because you're like, uh, <laughs> girl, what are you, why are you so, <laughs> why are you so averse to these methods? If that's the method, that's the method. However, I just felt it was weird. I mean, I can't imagine somebody coming up to me and saying, hey, I have a security incident. And I say, okay, well, we're just going to completely take everything down and treat it as an incident without any kind of like, okay, let me check and see and validate. Uh, let me double check the logs. Let me like, there's other things that happen before you then go into it. This is an incident and we need to shut everything down. Everything needs to be unplugged. You know, you, so I felt like they were just like, they weren't really taking it as methodically as I wanted. Um, so the last attempt, which is the one that I ended up keeping was a test and that felt more official to me. And maybe I felt I needed to pay for something because I did pay for that test. It was not covered by insurance. And so I took the test and it was a very painful test, as I say here in the tweet, uh, where essentially they tell you to click every time you see a green circle, but you're going to see like a green circle, a red circle, or no circle at all. And you had to pay attention for 20 minutes as they flash across the screen. And every time you see a green circle, you're supposed to click. And it was 
it's terrible. I feel like it's the perfect test to see if you have ADHD because it's it's almost impossible. Within two minutes, I was already tired. Like I felt sleepy. I couldn't concentrate. I was like, did, did I miss it? Does that, and I would just click randomly because I'm like, I don't know if I missed a green or if that was a red. And and so by the end, I was like, oh man, even if they say, if they say that I don't have it, I'm going to ask if there's something else because it was really rough. And so I got a 67% uh, in threshold for AD, for being classified as ADHD was 50. So I was like, okay, cool. This I can take to, from doctor to doctor. And I have confidence that this is accurate rather than you just listening to me say whatever and, and deciding to diagnose me. Um, so I was placed on medication already before. Um, however, I was solid in it and tried different things from this point on because I felt comfortable with the diagnosis. Um, so I put the side note of the medical industry is a mess. And I think that it is, at least in my experience, um, that was a very, very interesting uh, scenario or, or experience just for diagnosing ADHD. I felt like it should be a little bit more streamlined. Um, so just a fun fact, if you ever want to get diagnosed yourself, you may struggle. So where am I now? Um, right now, I am working with an ADHD therapist. I started a couple months ago. Um, I'm also taking medication when and if I need, because uh, sometimes I'm able to manage a pretty uh, focused day, and then sometimes I make it till about 12 and have done nothing. So I do take my medication when I need, um, and I still have to figure out which one works best for me. So that's been a process. I eat cleaner because of the research done that contribute where eating cleaner, a cleaner diet kind of helps you with um, just your brain chemistry in general. So I have been eating cleaner. I did Whole30, um, and that kind of kicked that off. I'm also developing a lot of personal systems for myself because someone with ADHD that lacks executive function needs to have structure, needs to have routine. And this is what my current therapist is working me th working with me through. Um, whereas the old the other therapist, uh, we didn't have that kind of relationship. She wasn't a she wasn't specialized in ADHD. So uh, there were other things that we were working on. Um, and then I learned about I'm I've been learning about living with ADHD. I've been learning about sticking to routines and what that means. And it's not just do it because <laughs> because it's right or do it because grind culture, you know, grind or die. It's really because without it, I won't be able to live a functional life. So here's some other things to note about where I'm at with it. I have changed from something is wrong with me to nothing is wrong with me. My brain just works differently. And I simply support myself with actions um, that help me show up better in my day-to-day -day life. I'm more compassionate with myself instead of frustrated. Um, I've dropped the internalized negative opinions of myself uh, because I understand what's going on more. And I'm still a work in progress. Every single day I learned that as I was making this talk or developing this talk, I learned so much about uh, ADHD on top of what I've already learned. So um, there's no one size fits all. There's nothing you know that I might give that you might not be able to maybe something I would give you to you today, you might not be able to use, but I think it's fun to kind of try different things and look at it more as an experiment. Uh, maybe that's the inner tech nerd in me, the inner hacker in me that wants to experiment with all this stuff, but um, it, it's been a very interesting journey and not all bad actually. So some important resources that I've used, um, that have helped me to understand ADHD a lot better is the YouTube channel. She's got so many, I feel like her name is Jessica. She's got so many different videos and they're very short. So, which is great for us that cannot pay attention that long. Um, and they kind of help you understand what it is with tools and tricks that she's used, you know, a whole bunch of things. The graphics to the left and some that I've used throughout the presentation are developed by certain people. Um, this one in particular is Danny Donovan. Um, there's also another one, ADHD Alien, and then on Instagram, the ADHD Bree. They all make graphics that kind of share their experiences or things that they know about ADHD. Um, and it just can help you feel seen without having to read a book. <laughs> um, and then also websites. There's uh, the Attitude magazine. I enjoyed it completely. It's, it has a lot of resources on it. They're geared a little bit towards children sometimes. However, they do have resources for, uh, for uh, adults as well. 
and any advice. So I have a couple things to say before I switch it over to questions. I just really wanted to prioritize any questions that anyone had. Um, but if you're curious about it, if anything I said today kind of triggered you to be like, I've had that experience, whoa, what is this? I would say it doesn't hurt to take an assessment. Um, if you have the, if you have to pay or whatever, I think it's it was worth it for me. I don't know if you're, if your ailments or what you're struggling with is impairing anything, if it's affecting anything in a very serious manner or in a manner that you don't like, I think it's worth it to go through that route if you can do so. Um, also be your biggest advocate. Uh, I That's what I was doing when I picked different ways of being assessed. I wanted to make sure I felt comfortable with the assessment. Um, the doctors will kind of say whatever, because they're kind of like, well, I went to medical school, listen to me. But you have to be comfortable for yourself because it is you that is treating your own ADHD. So making sure that you're okay with everything that's happening and you don't do anything before you're ready. Like I didn't take medication until I was ready. I didn't even entertain the idea until I was ready. Or I tried other things before that point. So so making sure that you're just comfortable through that process is going to be important. You're the only one that knows how you feel about anything. And so if you keep yourself out of the equation, you kind of rob yourself of being an active participant in your healing process. Um, also, find a therapist that specializes in ADHD. This is something I didn't realize would be that effective. I thought a therapist is a therapist is a therapist. That is not the case. Um, in the short time I've been seeing this one, there have been so many strides made. Like I have, I hadn't been able to look at schoolwork pretty much all year. I passed two classes since working with her. Um, and so that kind of shows the amount of care that goes into it. She goes over my day-to-day -day with me, my roadblocks. She's very well versed in how somebody with ADHD would react to something. And through her, she actually opened up my eyes that a lot of people get diagnosed with anxiety and depression, but it's really ADHD. And the anxiety and depression is just a result of your life and how it looks with unmanaged ADHD. So that is something that I would not have had access to had I not found somebody specialized. So that's definitely something I would say do. Also be resourceful. I know I made the comment earlier about that, some people having that naturally and some people having to develop that, but not taking no for an answer is definitely something that has helped me in a lot of ways. I've had great success in my career despite my challenges, but that is because I don't take no for an answer. I And even in my whole ADHD, uh, kind of journey, you don't take no for an answer, you don't take one thing, you you consult different re, uh, different uh, sources to see what sticks. Um, so that is definitely something I would say develop if you don't have it or utilize if you do. And all in all, don't give up on yourself. Like, you know, you can get through anything if you just are patient and willing to go through the process. It sucks sometimes and sometimes it's frustrating because you don't know what the heck is happening. However, don't give up. You can do it. So key takeaways before I wrap up, you need to be your biggest advocate. Like I just said, take your power back. Um, make sure uh, Having ADHD doesn't mean that life is over. You can have ADHD and still be successful. I think a lot of people who are successful, actually you'll find out that they have something that, ha that they're struggling with or that they've had to deal with. Um, so it's not a disqualifier. Also, you know you better than anyone else. So make sure to get help when you need to. Don't let people talk you out of it. And that kind of was my problem. I had people talking me out of just even trying to figure out if I had ADHD and saying, oh, you don't have that. Don't worry about it. You just need to focus more. You just need to, sometimes it's not just you need to do anything but get evaluated. <laughs> so make sure that you get the help when you need to. There's no need to suffer in silence because someone else thinks that you're just not trying hard enough. And last but not least, there is nothing wrong with you. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Awesome job, Stephanie. Thanks so much for taking the time to uh, present and, and walking us through your your journey and experiences. Um, just checking through the, the Discord channel here, we've had a, a ton of back and forth through the threads here. Um, and we'll we'll dedicate a little bit of time to go over some questions from the audience for you. Sounds good. I'll share my camera. Awesome. So great, perfect. I can see you. 
Um, all right, so a few questions here. Um, any advice for being supportive to colleagues, friends, or partners who have ADHD? I know you talked about it um, a, a bit throughout your slides there, but anything in particular um, uh, for advice that you can mention to uh, be supportive? So the thing about support is that sometimes we are invested in the way that we want to support other people as opposed to the way that they need to be supported. So making sure that you maintain the intention of why you're supporting throughout that is very key. Um, I don't have many people who have diagnosed ADHD and are doing anything about it. I do have people who have other things, whether that be depression or bipolar disorder, and being patient and recognizing that their actions don't have anything to do with you and are not, in fact, considering you, uh, kind of helps to take some of that pressure off when it comes to, oh, this person didn't text me back or they're always late and I'm like a stickler for time or they forget everything that they're saying as they're saying it. Things like that, just being patient in that moment and remembering that, hey, this is not a choice, <laughs> that this is like something that's built in, it's as natural as breathing and that they actively have to work to be different. So sometimes they're not going to be able to perform. Sometimes they don't have the energy. Sometimes they don't have the, they don't know how to. Um, so being patient and then also knowing that you're probably not going to be their healer. You're not going to take away all their ailments. Um, sometimes you're gonna have to sit through their uncomfortable moments of, this really sucks and acknowledging that. So I would say good on you for asking about how to support. That's like a very good first step and not assuming that I know all the answers. I know how to just, I'm just gonna carry a whip and <laughs> follow them around. So <laughs> not doing that is perfect. <laughs> and asking more questions is definitely perfect. But sometimes you can ask them uh, and they might not know how you can help, but they will probably appreciate that you care enough to ask anyway. So. Yeah. Awesome. No, thank thank you for the advice there. Uh, I had a number of individuals on the chat here um, who asked similar questions as well. Awesome. Um, going on to some other questions. Um, do you think there's a higher percentage of folks with ADHD um, in our industry compared to other fields? It starts to feel like that because uh, People on my so now that I have spent time uh, looking at the symptoms and how it how it presents itself, there are people that are on my current team where I'm like, oh no, he has to. <laughs> there has to be some of that in there because, you know, you, I'm not even as bad as that. Um, so I would say probably I think to to deal with systems, you might have to be just a tad bit off of the norm <laughs> or what's considered norm. Um, and I do know that whenever I talk about ADHD too and, and my responses or my symptoms, a lot of people be like, oh, I do that too, or oh, that happens to me too. So I wouldn't actually, I would probably bet that there is a significant amount of people with any kind of neurodivergent thing going on um, in our industry. I, I, I believe that to be kind of true. <laughs> sure. No, thank, thanks for the uh, for the insight. Um, going to a few other questions here. Uh, everyone in the chat is saying uh, thank you so much, staff. Uh, you know, truth speaking the truth. I completely understand. Um, let's see. Uh, some other folks mentioned uh, just from a comment perspective. Um, I didn't get diagnosed until my 30s, uh, but it explains so much hindsight in my life. Um, oh my goodness, yes, yeah, same. <laughs> um, do you think um, with technology um, ever changing and growing nowadays, children growing up with, with so many inputs, uh, TV, iPhones, iPads, et cetera, um, do you believe from your perspective nowadays that more and more children are becoming uh, misdiagnosed? That's a great question. Uh, as in, I guess you can't clarify. So maybe you can share because <laughs> I'm saying so misdiagnosed as in they are diagnosed with ADHD but don't have it. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Uh, 
Wow, that's so interesting. I don't know because I feel like people. I feel like parents now, granted, I'm not a parent, so I just want to make sure that that's clear. I'm not a parent. I don't have children. However, I feel like parents don't want anything to be quote unquote wrong with their kid anyway. So I feel like there's always a reluctance to accept that there is a diagnosis period, especially at younger ages, um, because they haven't really developed yet and you don't really know where, which way that they're going to go. And some, sometimes things iron themselves out. Um, so I would say probably not just because it's not like parents are like, yay, my kid has ADHD. <laughs> Wonderful. I was waiting for this moment. So I think because of that, there might not be misdiagnosis. I think it would be more, I think maybe teachers might say, yeah, I don't know. Your kid has trouble with concentrating. Your kid has trouble with this. And the parent who probably would spend a lot more time with the kid or maybe see them in different kinds of environments may be able to say, oh, I don't know if that's truly the case and kind of keep an eye on it. But I, I don't know if misdiagnoses will go up per se. Sure. Okay. Checking in the chat here, I have a, another good question um, from the user Sushi Dude. Um, I've heard that there's less diagnosis of ADHD in girls because they don't follow the stereotype of ADHD that encountered uh, that's encountered with boys. What advice do you have for girls and women to recognize that they might have they, that they might be uh, neurodivergent? That's very tricky because I went all the way to my late twenties before the diagnosis. So I can't say for sure. I will say though, that I think as an industry and obviously like this is hard, right? But I think the psychiatry uh, industry <laughs> should probably be investing more in the signs that show up specific to girls or um, that they've seen. I think a lot of neurological uh, disorders of any sort are typically typed for male anyway. Like they've been, those have been the most researched. Those have been the most obvious, I guess, to people. Um, but I'm not actually sure. That's a very, that's a very tough question because of my own experience and how long I went without knowing and it not being an issue anywhere else but school and like anything that needed structure. So I don't know, other than paying attention more to what they're, what other people are doing or saying and seeing where they are. So if a person's like, oh, it's so easy to study for that test and it took you five days um, and you only read one line in the entire five days, those types of things definitely shouldn't be, should be taken a look at. So it's really hard. Other than talking about it regularly, like with everyone all the time, like making it a class where you just discuss things like that, like a, like an intro to psych disorders one-on-one -on -one in high school. I don't really know the answer to that. That's a, that's, that's hard. <laughs> Oh, thanks. Thanks for walking through the question. A lot of a lot of good questions coming from the uh, the group here for sure. Um, have time for a few more questions. Um, uh, what of what are your comments? Uh, I was really intrigued by um, you were mentioning that um, uh, you were looking at eating cleaner, um, trying a whole thirty. Um, how did this personally impact you um, uh, within your um, uh, diagnosis? So mood regulation is something that isn't talked about when it comes to uh, ADHD, but it's definitely something that exists. And a lot of people talk, or there's a lot of research on food and how it affects, especially when it comes to our intestines and our gut and, and the health of that, about how food affect, can affect our mood. So, like drastically and our mood impairs our ability to be able to do other things. And so for me, I do have some, a bit of mood regulation issues sometimes. And when I feel bad, it is a lot easier for me to give into my impulse, uh, my impulsiveness and just say, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm going to play Red Dead 
too. <laughs> or I'm going to I'm going to watch this movie, this new Netflix thing that came out, or I'm just going to go talk to my friends for five hours. Like those types of things are a lot easier for me to get away with when my mood is lower. Um, So when I'm eating healthier, I don't have those kinds of issues. When I was on Whole30, I actually didn't have many mood issues at all. And that was enough for me to be like something in the regular bad food (laughs) that I definitely was eating. I mean, I'm going to own that. It was bad food. Something in there is not good for me and has very bad effects on my mood, which trickle into how I'm able to manage my ADHD. Um, I read today, as I was just going over notes and stuff, I read about how there are supplements like fish oil being one of them that help you naturally um, combat attention issues. So even that would be available in healthier foods rather than like, you know, you're gonna find fish oil in Swedish fish. (laughs) Like, so... Those kinds of things are definitely things that I think pop up when I think about that. So that's how it helps me or how it's actually helped me recently. Um, But it's going to take me a little bit longer to come up with like multiple points of how food and eating healthier has helped because I've just started this a couple months ago. Absolutely. No, it's great. Great insights. Yeah. Uh, Diet can have a, a drastic impact on on many of uh ailments for for many different things so i it'll be interesting to see um and hear about later on um you know what uh what that has done for you um that's awesome um i have time for about one or two more questions looking in the chat here um does fatigue have an influence on symptoms that you feel sometimes so this is going to sound strange but Uh, Sometimes uh, if I have caffeine, I can get tired instead of be amped like certain people. And I've seen, now granted, I'm fuzzy on this, but I've seen that be mentioned when it comes to people with ADHD that caffeine actually works can work as a downer, as too much stimulation or too little. I'm not really sure. (laughs) But um, I will say that, and I'm having an ADHD moment right now. Can you repeat the question? (laughs) No, no, not a problem. Uh, Does fatigue have an influence on symptoms? Yeah. So I will say that sometimes I can feel tired. I don't know. And then also, too, for me, um, I have to do all of my mentally heavy tasks in the morning. If I leave it to the night, it won't get done. And I kind of connected that myself with uh, human beings having decision fatigue as the day goes on. Um, so the more tired you get, or the more you're making decisions throughout the day, your brain is like, oh, I'm over this. And then just defaults to <laughs> whatever feels easiest or the path, of le- the path of least resistance. Um, and so I think in that realm, yes. Uh, but in terms of like general, just tiredness, I don't really think that that has, I've experienced that too much in connection with ADHD, at least not that I can recall. Sure. Yeah, your uh, your your last comment there. Um, you know, thinking about something for too long, and yeah, I'm just kind of over this. You know, on to the next. Uh, some of the folks were saying, you know, you just described all of Infosec Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Uh, I'll just give about another minute to see if we have any additional questions on here. Just scrolling through the conversations here. Here's another question. Um, Do you find you can read the same sentence or piece of work over and over again and then wonder why you're reading it or even there? (laughs) Uh, Yes. Um, And that's why sometimes when it comes to studying, I will have to switch to video (laughs) instead of something written because I don't know what it is about it, but if I read something and it drifts into a realm that I'm not interested in for whatever reason, I can read that same thing and an hour can, I've actually watched four hours go by and I read the same paragraph the entire time. Now, granted, I would go to my phone to, <laughs> but I was not getting anything done at all. So I think, so I think yes is the answer. <laughs> A lot of a lot of people resonating with uh, with this as well. <laughs> yes, um, awesome. I think we 
are good on questions. Um, the only thing I do not see in your contact information is your uh, Red Dead 2 handle. I'm sure there will be <laughs> others outside of myself that would be interested in playing with you. But um, yeah, that'll that'll wrap it up. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for your time and and going over um, your presentation and, and journey with us. It was it was awesome. Thank you, everyone who's listening. Thank you so much for for listening to me, for asking questions, for commiserating. I appreciate it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. And um, make sure you don't uh, exit out of the window there. I will take care of um, removing you from the GoToWebinar. Thanks for reminding me, because I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. That's what I'm here for. Thanks again, Stephanie. Thank you.